So, welcome to the session. So, let's get started. Uh, this is how it works, in case you've not been to one of these Friday sessions before. This is about all about the effective pricing software, where I usually show you something uh, for, for 20, 50, 20, 20, 30 minutes. But actually, what's really important is me answering your questions. So, you just need to let me know what you want to know about the software, and I will answer them as best as I can. Uh, um, those of you, if you don't know me, my name is, is Mark Wickersham. Most of you do. I recognize your names from, uh, from the chat box. Most of you, many of you have been to other sessions this week. But anyway, my name is Mark Wickersham, uh, and uh, I teach accountants how to, uh, how to master value pricing. Uh, so I thought I'd start off with uh, a quick success story. It's actually one I got a, f a couple of months ago, but I've not really shared it for a while. Uh, but it's somebody who was using the software for the first time, and I thought it was just interesting because it demonstrates that sometimes just get out, get on, and do it. Today's session, by the way, is I know there's a few people who have been here several times. Today's session is really a beginner session, and and uh, because we've had uh, two weeks ago, we did quite an advanced session, which was about how could you create uh, how can you create versions of the software for your clients and earn money as part of, for example, a price consulting program. And so if you're at that high level and you missed that, that was two weeks ago, and that's on my YouTube channel at the moment. Uh, last week, we kind of did an intermediate session, uh, and we looked, at, we looked in detail. At, we looked at uh, the, the, the different options, how, different things you can do in the settings for bronze, silver, gold. Today's a beginner session. Today's really suited to you if you've not really got up and running. And I have a brand new resource to share with you today. Uh, rather than showing you the software, I'm going to show you a resource first, and then I'll answer uh, questions. Uh, but I just thought I'd share this with you. This was Viviana, posted in my Facebook group a, a couple of months back now. She said, update, uh, I made the program, that's the effective pricing software, work to help me with this one meeting. Uh, she said, uh, but even with having the program uh, with very little knowledge, I have, uh, I, I have, I went through the effective pricing model and they agreed to premium package, which very often happens. Uh, I definitely wouldn't have been able to price at that level on my own. Uh, there was little pushback. Uh, went back, changed one thing, and, there we, and then we closed a deal. Thank you, Mark, for all your help. I can't wait to actually set the software correctly and learn from your, your training to continue growing my practice. And she went on to say an update. Also, I was able to enjoy the meeting because no matter what I knew, that at the end of the meet, at the end, I was going to be able to work with the client for a price that was good to him and to me. So I think the key message I want to get out of that is I find that those people that get success just get started. And then they work out how to perfect it later. We never, we will never start with perfection. If you want to be perfect first, you'll never get started. You'll never get going. So please don't try to get your pricing perfect, your pricing models perfect. Uh, that just won't happen. Uh, we need to just get started. Okay, so uh, so today's session, uh, anything else I want to show? No, that was it. So today's session, uh, as I say, aimed at beginners, if you've got questions for me, that's it. If you've got questions for me, uh, most of you, I think, are on Zoom, or a lot of you are on Zoom right now, uh, and so you know the drill. If you've got questions, use the Q and A box. Uh, don't use the chat box now because I'll get distracted by stuff, but Sarah and Emily are here, and she'll be watching the, the, the chat box. Uh, use the Q and A if you're on Zoom. If you're anywhere else, I think we've, this is um, at the moment on my YouTube channel, uh, and which is actually where Anna and Isaac are. Um, if you're on my YouTube channel or if you're on Facebook, then just type your questions into the comments box. I, I can see them coming up uh, and I will, I will answer them. Um, but before we get onto the questions, uh, let's uh, look at the resource that I've created for you. So I think it's this button here. Uh, in fact, Emily created much of this, so she gets much of the credit. Uh, so we've, this was a request from one of the members of the Value Pricing Academy a, few, uh, a month or two back, they said, they said, would it be possible to create a checklist? A, a checklist that we could use to help us with certain things with getting the software set up. So this is the resource that we've uh, created for you. Uh, and it's a series of checklists. So what we're going to do is uh, my team, Sarah or Emily, they're going to put the, the link in the, I can see Sarah's done it in, in Zoom already. Emily's going to put it into the various social channels. You will find the link uh, um, and you'll find the link. You can open it up if you want. You might see it better than what's on the screen right now. That's entirely up to you. 
Uh, hi there, Zach from London in the UK. Uh, welcome to the session. I don't think we've met before either. Uh, there's a few people, I think, on uh, YouTube I don't know, but great to see you. Uh, so, uh, yes, if you're on Facebook, I know that, the, the, that it's gone there and it's also on YouTube. So the first thing, if you've never used the software before, the very first time uh, you go into the software, uh, it will take you through an onboarding process, uh, a series of steps of simple little tasks just to get you up and running and introduce you to the key elements of, of what the software does, how to get it set up. So you can get up and running fast. And so the first checklist is really that onboarding process. And what we've done in the checklist as well is we put through links to various other resources that will help you, the video training and so on. What we've also done, if I just fast forward uh, actually, I won't fast forward, but at the very end, you'll see there's a the part of the checklist will tell you how to get support. So just taking you through it very quickly, and then we'll dive into questions. Uh, when you first go into, the, actually, the first checklist, sorry, is how to get your account. So if you've not even got the software yet, then uh, uh, you'll find step one of the checklist is a link to the website. So you can go and check out effective pricing, see if it's right for you. And then if you register, uh, this checklist is the process that will take you through to register. It's very simple, but there are a couple of very important things in terms of making sure you select the right country for you. That's the first checklist. Uh, the second checklist is called, um, let me just check, I've, uh, uh, I'm pulling it up. Uh, now, why is it not? Okay. Here we go. Second checklist is called the onboarding checklist then. So what happens when you first get the software is it's going to ask you to do seven tasks before you can get fully up and running. The first one is just to customize the software. So one of the things that you can do, and if you saw David's session, David Pankovich's session yesterday, you'll know that you can fully customize the software. When you first get it, it looks like, oh, wrong. Uh, it, it looks like this with the effective pricing logo. You can change it so it's got your logo and it's got your color scheme. So we'll, uh, uh, we can talk about it later if you want. Uh, and so all you have to do is the, the first step of onboarding invites you to go into the settings, upload your logo in there. You can change the colors if you want. You can always go back later if you want to, but just start to customize it. The second thing you might want to do is just make some changes to the company settings. So that might be to add on an extra user or probably the other thing you might want to do if I just go back uh, uh, to here. In the top right, you can have your avatar image, your face, if you want, your image if you want. So you can customize it as well by having you in the top right. Uh, and if you've got other team members using it, then uh, equally they could have, they can have uh, their image there. Uh, then what will, you'll do is you'll create your first pricing model. So you can, you can price any service that you, the limits your imagination, you could price anything doesn't have to be accounting services, which is why two weeks ago we talked about how your clients could use this. You could, you could price legal services, you could price setting up a website, uh, but of course we're accountants so we focus on that. And you can either create one from scratch or you can use one of the ones that's been written for you as a starting point. So one of the first things you want to do is to create your pricing model. And there's another checklist further down that will walk you through that. Uh, so uh, so that'll, that'll make life easy for you. Uh, then what you'll do is create your first proposal template. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So you can use the software to A, give a price and agree a price with the client in the meeting. And then when you've done that, after the client's left, you can produce a professional looking uh, template, a proposal, sorry. Uh, and again, if you were at David's session yesterday, uh, David, your proposal template looks stunning. You, I, I have to say your design skills are amazing. So that was, so you can, you can create um, your first proposal template. Then in the onboarding, you do your first quote, and I suggest you do it as a test. Just play with it, go through the process. Uh, then produce a test proposal, produce a proposal, and then finally, you can create your first uh, pricing success metric as a draft. Okay, that's the onboarding. So let me just walk you through uh, some of the other checklists uh, so that you can, just so you can see what the checklists are. I'm not gonna go through them in detail because you've got the, you can read this uh, I want to really get onto questions, which is more important, and show you the things that you want me to show you. But as I go through this, if you're thinking, what's that Mark's talking about? I'm intrigued by that. What's that? How do I do that? Can he show me? Yes, that's the point of these sessions. I will show you the things on the software that you want to know. 
So just ask questions, stick them in the Q&A box, uh, stick them in the comments, ask me your questions, and we'll get to those in a bit. Uh, so next thing on the next checklist is to create your first pricing model. So the checklist works you through this, walks you through the steps, and I recommend that the first time is rather than reinventing the wheel and building something from scratch. That's great once you've got some expertise and you've used the software a few times, then yes, by all means, build a pricing model from scratch. Build a model like how to do, I don't know if Ren is here, but how to do virtual finance director or virtual CFO service. You could build a model from scratch. My advice is start with one of the pre-written ones because I've written, I've written um, many models for you. Which ones you get access to depends on your plan, whether you go for the starter plan, the full plan or the pro plan. So if you go for the pro plan, for example, I've already written models for how to price annual financial statements, bookkeeping, uh, how to price business startups, clean up work, cloud setup, forecasting, payroll, tax returns, uh, and so on. So my advice is the first time, grab from within the software an existing model. And what happens is when you do that, it clones it. It takes the one that's been written and within seconds creates your version of it. And then you can change it. And what this checklist does is it walks you through the process of editing and changing your model. So you can change the questions you ask the client. You can change the, way, the, the packages. What do you build into your bronze, silver, gold, which we looked at in detail last week. Uh, you can change what the upsell might be. And then finally, the last step is you can then, uh, you can then uh, go through and if I turn to go to the next page, you can then review it. You can do some tests and playing with the numbers to see if you're happy with the prices that are coming out. Uh, and if not, you can go backwards and forwards and keep, keep making some changes. So this checklist takes you through the steps for, for doing that, for creating that first model. Okay. Um, so if you haven't created a model yet, uh, or you, you can't remember how to do it, that checklist will help you uh, with some overview guides uh, for doing that. Now, once you've got your model up and running, once you've built a model, it might be how to price bookkeeping work, for example, you've got a pricing model for bookkeeping, the next thing you'll wanna do is do a quote for a client. Now, I recommend the first time you test it so that you do a quote not sat in front of the client, but pick one of your existing clients and answer the questions how you think they would answer them based on your knowledge, uh, just to see the process. So do a test first. And so this checklist is for your first quote. And what you'll find is that there's a link at the top that takes you to some training videos that walk you through in detail. And Emily has also written some user guides, some sh little one-page guides, uh, and the links to all of those, there's six of them, are on this page. You can click through, and if you prefer to read rather than to watch videos, you've got two choices. And so those video, the videos, the, uh, the links at the top to the PDFs, they will give you more detail than what's in this checklist. The checklist is the summary for doing your first quote. And essentially what you do is once you've put in the client's details, what you'll do is you'll then answer questions for example, if it's bookkeeping, how many transactions, how many, how many bank accounts do you have? Uh, how frequently do you want the, uh, the bookkeeping doing, weekly or monthly? So you ask questions. Once you've answered the questions, ask the questions. Once you've got the answers to the scope of work and the client's choices and preferences, you then get taken to the page where you show your packages. If you like your bronze, silver, gold, there's a button then to reveal the price. If the price is too high, you can go back and work with the client to change the package and so on. Once the client says yes, then you can do your upsell, your enhancements. You can also talk about the payment plan, when the exact payments, once they've said yes. Uh, and then you can review the quote. Uh, and that's the, the step, that's the process for doing a quote. Now, assuming it's a real quote, not a test one, the first time will be a test one. But once you've done a live quote, and the client said yes, just like in Viviana's case study. If the client says yes, I want the premium one, yes, I'm happy with that. Once you've finished, once you've finished doing the quote, uh, at that point in time, the client can leave the office or you may have your other onboarding. But once they've left, there's two things that you'll want to do to finalize things. And one of those is your pricing success metric. And it's a simple process that's essentially, there's a checklist for it. The purpose of the price success metric is you have a dashboard which tells you how you are getting on, how you're progressing with your pricing. Are you getting better prices than you would have done without the software using the old technique of value, uh, time-based billing? And so you can track your progress. It invites you to score yourself 
and, and it creates a score for you. So uh, there's a checklist there for that. And, and the other thing that you'll want to do is create your proposal. Now, on the subject of proposals, there are, if you haven't yet played with the proposals, there are two that you want to do first. So when you're working through the onboarding process, we mentioned earlier, when you work through the onboarding process, one of the things it'll tell you to do is to create your first proposal. I recommend the very first, the two proposals you create first are two one-page proposals. There are two places in the software, two places where you might want to print out a nice proposal before you finish the process. At the end of the process, you'll have your nice, long, fancy one, like the one that David uh, showed in his webinar yesterday. But there are two one-page ones that you might want to use. The first one is when you reveal the price for the first time and you have your bronze, your silver, and your gold, and the client can see the price, sometimes the client might say, I need to go away and think about it. Can you give me a, can you give me a printout of that page? Now, it's not the best outcome. If they want to go and think about it, then there's obviously an objection somewhere. So we need to bring in our objection handling skills and find out what it is. Perhaps we've not explained the value properly. But there may be a reason why they want to go away and think about it. So there's a print button on that page when you reveal the price. And that print button prints out effectively what's on that screen. What's in the packages? What are the prices? And there's a default, there's a default one that's fairly ordinary. You might want to put your logo on there and some other wording. And so what I've done is I've built for you a suggested one page. I call it the draft proposal because they've not agreed at this point in time. It just shows the packages. And so I've built for you a proposal that's called the draft proposal. So what I recommend you do, and if you follow this checklist, just grab that proposal, clone it. You can grab it. it takes a few seconds, just sec seconds to do, and then make some changes. Make it yours. Make sure your logo's there. You might want to add some text that says something like, this is a draft proposal for you, um, and, and whatever else you might want to add. The second one-page one that you'll want to set up is when the client agrees the price, before you finalize the meeting, you want to also agree the exact payments. So when do they start? When's the first payment? When's the second payment? That's the payment plan. And if you want to, before the client leaves, you could print out a one-page report that lists all the play payments that show the sales tax on top and the dates. So there's complete clarity of when they start paying you the exact amounts. And once again, there is a default one already set up, but I recommend that what you do is follow this checklist, grab the one I've created for you, which is a bit prettier, and then change it, add some things. You might want to add at the bottom, for example, your standard cancellation policy. Whatever you want to do, you can tailor it. And then the final step, and this is a really important step with this checklist, is with these two one-page proposals, you need to go into all of your pricing models and tell them which one-page which, which one proposal to use in the event that you click on that print button at the appropriate time. Okay, if anything I say confuses you, we can look at these things. Uh, if, you, if you've got questions, we'll, we'll dive a bit deeper. But let me just go through uh, what else we've got in this document. So then you might want to create your full proposal or, or fixed price agreement or engagement letter, whatever you want to call it. This document walks through the process together with links to training videos for exactly how to create those beautiful proposals like David showed his, in the session yesterday. Uh, so here's the, st the steps that you go through to create a proposal. Um, okay, uh, next. Uh, next checklist is then once you've got your proposal template set up, the next checklist is actually producing the proposal. So once you've created a few proposal templates and you've done a quote for a client, and remember there's a checklist earlier, once you've done the quote for the client, the client then leaves the room, leaves the, your office because you, or leaves the Zoom meeting because they've now agreed to the price, they've agreed the payment plan. Once everything's agreed, the two steps you want to do afterwards is number one is the price success metric, there's a checklist for that. And the other thing is you might want to create a nice, beautiful proposal that you can send to the client uh, to sign. Or you could do what David did, he showed yesterday and David in the session yesterday. Uh, and by the way, if anyone missed the session yesterday with David, um, we could put a link to that, the recording, uh, uh, if you want to see that. Uh, David talked about how he takes the proposal from 
the software from effective pricing and then puts into practice ignition and then uses practice ignition for the onboarding and getting and, and collecting payments and, and everything else. Uh, so that checklist is how you uh, produce the proposal. Uh, now, another checklist that you, you might want to do, somebody, somebody uh, a good friend of mine in, in Texas, Dave, David Colts, who may well be here, David asked for a feature a little while ago, which we built into the software, which I think is a really powerful feature. And that is when you create your proposal template and you then, uh, you then decide to send the template to the, the proposal to the client, you might want to automatically pull into the proposal certain pieces of information from your database. And these are what are called keywords. So a keyword, and so there are many standard ones in the software. So for example, one of the keywords would be the price. And so in your proposal, if you want to say um, the price is, you would insert the keyword and it will pull in the price that you've then agreed with the client automatically. But you also have the ability to create your own custom keywords. So let's say that you create engagement letters. You want to do an engagement letter. And one of the things you always put in the engagement letter is the, the client's fine, uh, annual, uh, sorry, accounting, accounting year end date, the date of their accounting year end. Then one of the things that you can do is you can create a custom keyword. It's really, really easy. And this, pro, this, this checklist tells you how you do it. Um, now, this is more of an advanced feature. If you're a beginner, you can do this later as you get more familiar with the software. The final, the final checklist is how you then get help from our team. So there's a number of different ways. There's a lot of video training. There's these live sessions, which are gonna be most Fridays. And then you can always, within the software, and if I just quickly switch across uh, to the software, in the bottom right of the software, you will see a little uh, icon here. And this opens up how you can get help. Okay, so you can get help within the software and there you see the lovely Sarah's face and she's ready to help you. Or if you want, you prefer, you can email her direct. Okay, that checklist was done to help you get up and running. I'd love to know your feedback if, that, if, if, if you find that helpful. If there's any other checklists to do with the software you'd like to build in there. Someone asked us about the checklist for custom keywords, so we built that one in there. So I hope that's gonna help you get up and running fast. Okay, questions. I'm here to answer your questions. We have at the moment four questions in the Q&A box. I don't think there's any in, in YouTube or Facebook yet, so I'm gonna deal with the Q&A in Zoom for now. If we run out of questions, I have, I do actually have, and I probably will cover it, I have a pre-submitted question from, actually two questions from Scott Mousseau, uh, who I think is in the Value Pricing Academy or the Bookkeeper's Pricing Academy, so I will answer those, Scott, if you are listening. Although you did say you might not make it today, which is why you pre-submitted. So uh, Eddie says, Eddie, Eddie says, uh, Samedo says, is David's proposal available for viewing? And I don't know the answer to that one. Uh, a question that I do have for David, I was going to, I'm going to email you late uh, at some point, David, before Monday, is because we had a lot of requests, uh, and that is, um, are you happy for us to share your slides? Um, the answer might be no, I can't remember. If the answer is yes, we may only share them with the Academy members because there's lots of very sensitive information on there. Um, but David, if you're willing to share the slides, then I will share them with Academy members. Um, is your proposal available? Obviously, I can't answer that, Eddie. Um, if David's happy to share some screenshots or something, we can do that. It's a beautiful proposal. It's actually based reasonably closely on the template one that I've done for you anyway. What Dave has done is he's, he's just switched out some of the images. It's got his logo, his color scheme, uh, rather than one that I've created for you. So you could, with a little bit of work, you could create a very similar proposal yourself because I've created it for you in terms of the words, some images and so on. Uh, you can change it uh, if you want. So I don't know the answer to that one. Um, uh, and I don't want to put pressure on David, but if he's willing to share some screenshots of his proposal or, or whatever, or PDF, then we can do that. Uh, Nancy says, uh, generally, do you recommend having the proposal being an appendix, addendum to the legal contract, or do you embed all the legal mumbo jumbo in the proposal? That's an interesting question, Nancy. So here's my thoughts. Now, just bear in mind that I sold my accounting firm in 2006. So I've not been in practice for a few years now. 
But I was from the UK. I was, I was a, I'm, a char, I'm a qualified chartered accountant. So I was a member of the ICAW, the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales. Probably the closest equivalent to a CPA in the US and Canada. And, and, and so being part of a professional uh, body, it was, a, uh, it was a professional requirement to do an engagement letter. Now, I can't comment on engagement letters around the world because everybody's here. From, there's people from Ghana, uh, there's people from uh, Canada, and there's some people who are part of professional organizations and some that are part. Uh, ah, so, so bear in mind that probably everybody here is in a different situation. However, if you're a profession, if you're a qualified professional, there is probably some form of professional requirement to do an engagement letter. And you should. Now, an engagement letter, the way I look at the engagement letter uh, and, and thinking about the, the standard ones or the, the, the sorts of things that the institute that I was in suggested, they are very boring. As Nancy says, um, legal mumbo jumbo. I think that's a good description for an engagement letter. Legal mumbo jumbo. The way I think of it is the engagement letter is really the terms and conditions. It's the terms and conditions. So, for example, the ICAW, uh, when I was in practice, would suggest things like you would have a, uh, a dispute resolution clause. What happens if you just have a dispute with the client? What happens? Who's the arbiter of that? So there was, I had a, sec, I had a paragraph about that in the engagement letter. So you should have it. It's, it's good practice to have one, uh, but it's also they're usually fairly boring, the legal mumbo jumbo. So, uh, and really clients aren't really that interested in reading the terms and conditions. We have to have them. What the client is much more interested in, the things that the client wants to know is, what's the price? What am I getting for it? When do I pay you? They're the kind of, it's the commercial terms is the more important bit. And so Nancy's question is, do we create a proposal that has both the, 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 the commercial stuff that we're all most interested in what are we doing? What's the price? When do we pay it? And the legal mumbo jumbo. Uh, my personal suggestion, and I'm happy for people to put comments in the chat box, is I would keep them as two separate documents, two set, and get them to get them to sign both. You need, you should have both. I would keep them separate because I think that the the proposal is the stuff that is it's important stuff, but the proposal is also your. It's your sales document, if you like. You, you want to make your proposal read so it really builds up the value. You want to use great language and structure. You, you want to make it so that it's a real, they, they're getting, they're getting a, a great service, a great value. The price seems really small because you've chunked it down to monthly payments, whatever it might well be, all the techniques. Uh, and I've built a proposal for you in the software so you could use that as a starting point. So I would keep them both separate, Nancy. Now, with effective pricing, when you build your proposal templates, you can create an engagement letter template or engagement letter templates. You can have engagement letter templates and proposal templates stroke fixed price agreements. When you do a quote for a client, when the client agrees the price, then after the client's left the meeting, and I recommend it's done after the meeting, you then create the proposal and you select the particular proposal you want. I want the bookkeeping proposal and then you can change it and tweak it for the client. Once you've done the proposal, you can then go back into that client's quote and add a second proposal. In other words, you can create, when you create a quote and agree a price with the client, you can actually assign to that quote more than one proposal. So that means you could have a proposal and engagement letter and assign both of them. Keep them, but keep them separate is my, is my suggestion to you. Uh, so thank you, Nancy. That was a great question. Uh, let's see... Uh, if, if, uh, if Emily or Sarah could make a note um, about some of these key topics, because we'll put them in the timestamps. My team know what that means. So uh, uh, we'll have some engagement letters. Right. Sarah Kelly says, uh, do you change the template prices and questions for each client or do you use one main template and allow the questions price to accumulate into a final customized price? OK, Sarah. Um, so. Uh, and I'm going to switch across at this point because some people are probably thinking, what's this software? So let me switch across and I keep grabbing the wrong mouse. Uh, so when you go in um, to the software, uh, on the left-hand side is all the services that you've set up. Now, I've set up a lot of services because I'm doing demos, so you have to price payroll, forecasting, etc. And I, as I select these, uh, I can then do the pricing process with the client. But uh, if I go to, uh, let me just move uh, our chat system, our help system out of the way. The cogwheel in the top right of the software, I'm just moving my mouse. This is where you go behind the scenes and set everything up. 
and the and this is where you can customize it, put your logo, do your proposal templates. The place that you will go to most often is model management. So let me just go there. And what this will list at the bottom, it will with a with a yellow button that says use model, it will list all the ones that we've written for you based on your plan. If you're on the starter plan, you will not see this many. Uh, you'll just get some introductory ones. Uh, and so if you hit use model, it clones it and you get a copy of it. Now I've made lots of models because I'm always demonstrating. So these are all the models that I've set up. So to answer your question, Sarah, and Sarah, let me just read it again. Uh, do you change the template, the prices and questions for each client? No, you, that, that'll be too much work. What I would do is, what you want to do is create a separate template for the main services. But once you've figured out for bookkeeping what your the best questions are, then you'll use the same bookkeeping template, the pricing template for each client. The exception would be one of the things you might want to do, and it's really easy to do. It may be that you want to change the pricing model for specific types of clients. So let's say, for example, at the top of the screen here, uh, I have one that's called bookkeeping full model, which is the one I usually often demonstrate when I'm demonstrating how to price bookkeeping. Let's say that you, you've got a bookkeeping model like this one you really like. But let's say that you also have a niche that you specialize in in lawyers. And one of the things you found is that when you're pricing for lawyers, there's a few things you might want to do a little bit different, have some slightly different questions. So what you can do really easily is you build your model that you love, your main model. And then as I move to the right, you may see as well as editing, there's also a button called clone. So if I clone this bookkeeping full model, what it will do is it will take a copy of it. Um, the name will be called bookkeeping full model. And you'll know it's cloned because straight after the name of the model, it inserts the date and time you've cloned it. So what you might now want to do is rename this. So I might say, right, I'm going to call this one bookkeeping uh, for lawyers. Uh, and at the moment, it's exactly the same as my full bookkeeping one. I can attach a different one-page proposal, by the way. This is where you attach your one-page proposals I mentioned. Uh, but then what I can do is, as I, as I hit save and continue, this is now the workflow of building or editing your models. You can change the questions. You can change the packages. So it might be for lawyers, you want to call your essential full premium something different. You might want to use some different language that lawyers relate to. You might want to change the packages for your lawyer's version. It may be that in the questions, as well as asking, for example, uh, let me hit the edit button, how many active bank accounts do you have? Lawyers might keep client, client accounts, bank accounts for clients, where they, they hold client monies. Uh, and so if you're doing lawyers, that might be a, an important scope question. And so what I might do is, let me just cancel that. You might therefore want to click add a question. And I want, might want to ask my lawyer's version, how many uh, client accounts do you have? Uh, and, and, uh, and so we can set a price up for that. And we can say that's going to be a value question. They're going to put a number in there. And I'm going to charge, I'm going to keep this one simple for now. I'm going to charge an extra $100 a year onto my bookkeeping price for each client account they have. Save. Uh, there's my question at the bottom. I might want that question to actually be straight after the bank account one. So now I've got a follow-up question to how many bank accounts, how many client accounts do you have? So I hope that helps, Sarah. That's a long explanation, but essentially, uh, essentially, yes, uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't create a different model for every client because that would be create a lot of work. But you might want to create variations of your models for specific types of client if you have niches. Okay, hope that one answered your question there. Great question. I like that one. Uh, what I'm going to what we've got 26 minutes. Great. We're going to get through. We've got six questions. I'm going to what I'm going to do, uh, and uh, let me just see. Uh, We've got some comments over here. What's this one? Anna Stone says, love checklist. Thanks, Anna. I'm glad you like that check. I'd love to get, when you get it, if you've got any feedback on the checklist, Anna, please give us feedback. And uh, if we can improve it, we will do. But I think Emily's done an amazing job with that. Uh, and uh, Minaxa says, hi. I've never met Minaxa before. She's on the YouTube, but uh, hi to you. Uh, so there's no other questions, though, on social. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer Scott's one because I thought it was an interesting one. He actually asked two. One's not strictly speaking about the software itself 
uh, and it will mean nothing to anybody unless you are part of the, the academy or done my how to price bookkeeping. Um, but I will just, I'll give a quick thought. He says, in terms of the regression analysis calculation, what would the suggestion be to calculate prices if I'm just starting out? Uh, I only really have two bookkeeping clients and feel that's not enough data to do a true regression analysis because of the size and scope of those clients. Okay, so let me explain what that means because some of you are thinking, what does that mean? One of the things I teach is that when you're moving away from hourly and moving to fixed pricing, not full value pricing, but fixed pricing, there's a, one of the challenges is how do I know what the price should be based on the scope? And so I teach a process called regression analysis where you use an Excel model and you can look at some existing clients, chunk some numbers, and it suggests a formula for you. And one of the things that Scott said is, uh, I don't have enough clients to do that. And, and that's often the case. And so if you don't, then what you can use is use a pre-written uh, pre, um, version. So let me explain what that means. If I go back to the software and if I go to... Uh, back to my models, um, hit the back button. Someone asked this the other day. You'll see one called Bookkeeping Special this, that I've pre-written. And sometimes people say, what's that Bookkeeping Special one? And that Bookkeeping Special model is, I did some uh, bookkeeping study based uh, on 2,683 people, took part in the study uh, a year ago last July. And what we did is we're looking at how much do people charge bookkeeping work for different types of clients. And what we did is we hired a mathematician who did a regression analysis, created, up a, for, created a formula, a formula for each of Canada, the US, UK, and rest of the world. Uh, and then we built that into that special model. And sat behind it is a formula that calculates a price for you for bookkeeping work based on certain scope factors, like how many transactions, how many bank accounts, and so on. It's an interesting place. It's a great place to start. If you have no idea how to price, then that model is useful to see because it's based upon benchmarking. It's based on what other people are charging for those sorts of clients. And so you, would, you may well find it useful, interesting as a starting point. Now, if you are in the price, my pricing academy, which I think Scott is, if you're in the value pricing academy or the bookkeeper's pricing academy, you'll know I teach value pricing. And what we really want to do is get away from cost plus mentality and copying what other people do and basing it on other people because they don't have, the profession generally does not know how to price. Most of the profession is too cheap, working too hard and not making enough. So we want to make sure that we're pricing in a different way in a better way. So Scott, my, if you're listening, if you're watching, my advice to, to you would be if you want to get access, you can use that special model if you want, but my advice would be uh, make keep working on the value pricing journey. Now the other question that he asked uh, pre-submitted one, which one that uh, nobody else has asked, but it's an I'm surprised nobody has. He says, is there a method or way to value price add-ons? Example, if a client approaches me and, and wanted my lowest package, but then two months later asks for something outside of the scope and add, uh, and add on a report or service, uh, or would it ultimately be at this stage within the contract a fixed price situation? Any suggestions on that? So let me just give this some context first, just so you know what uh, what Scott is talking about. And I need to just go back. Let me just go back into the software. So let me do uh, what I'm going to do is do a quote, um, and I'll pick something relatively simple. Uh, let me think. Let me try forecasting. I hope this is a, an example that will actually work. So imagine someone wants you to do a cash flow forecast. Um, it's Peter Rabbit wants it. Wants a cash flow forecast. So you're sat in front of the client. They want to buy. We might just want to ask them a few scope questions like, uh, for example, do you want a one-year forecast, a three-year forecast? Do you want cash flow only? Do you want a cash flow and profit forecast? Uh, you might ask questions like, do you want us to model different accounts receivables? Do you need us to deal with foreign currency transactions? Oh, yes, please, that's important for us. Uh, and, then, and then we get to the page, the page where we list the different choices. And, and, and Peter Rabbit says he wants the middle choice, the middle option. So we now reveal the price. The middle option is three payments of $864. And if that's too expensive for the client, you can go back and work with the client and change some of the answers. But let's say the client says, yes, I'm happy with that. I'm happy with the full forecasting, the middle option, and I'm happy with three payments of $864. Uh, by the way, you can change the currency symbol. So if you're in Ghana, for example, you don't have to use dollars. You can change it in the customization. This works in any country. 
But if we hit the select button, if the client says, I, I want uh, I want that for three payments of 864, great, you've made a sale, but that's not the end of the process. What you absolutely should be doing when the client says they want to buy is now we do what's called the upsell. That's what Scott's talking about. We should offer them something else. And somebody asked me in, I think, last week's session, they said, can you give some examples of what an upsell is? What might, what, what might I upsell? And I gave an analogy. I said that if, for example, you go to a shoe shop and you buy some shoes, so you buy these shoes for, let's say, $50, then when you get to the counter to pay for those shoes, very often a good shoe shop will say, to keep your shoes looking this shiny, this great, we recommend this particular polish, it's only 10 bucks. And what happens is many people say yes to that because if they're buying $50 shoes and they want them to keep look, perhaps that's cheap, perhaps $100 shoes, they want them to look that great, then what's 10 bucks on some, on some polish that's gonna make them look really, really good? And so the customer then pays an extra 10 bucks for the, and, and pays more money. Uh, the upsell is extremely important. And the reason why you should always have an upsell is because the client's made the buying decision. The worst that can happen is the client says, no, thank you, I don't need that. But very often they'll say, yes, you increase the sale. So an upsell is really important. So in the software, when you hit select, uh, what then happens is it then takes you to, it's called enhancements in the software. It's an upsell. It's an upsell. Uh, the reason why I put enhancements is because the client sat with you. You don't want the client to see it says upsell. Uh, and also I use the language enhancements because that's essentially what it is. An upsell is when you sell something that's related to what they've just bought. So think shoe polish is a great enhancement and upsell to buying shoes. You buy a car and they will offer you the paint protection warranty to, so you can bring it back if you get paint chips. So a good upsell or good enhancement is something that is related to what they've bought, gives them a better result, and is usually a relatively small price. So Scott's question is, is there a method or way to value price add-ons or enhancements here? And I think what Scott's getting at is, what if I want to go through a process again of asking scope questions and preference questions and all this sort of stuff? No. Um, the enhancement, the, the way the pricing works behind the scenes, you want to keep it fairly simple because we're in enhancements or add-ons, so for example, if, if we want industry benchmarking in this case as an add-on, in this case, it's you can see that if you look at the price at the top, without the add-on, it was the, the clients agreed, agreed to $864 a month, remember? So the clients agreed to 864. Now we say to the client, um, when we do forecasting, one of the things that might, might really help is a really powerful one-page report we call it our industry benchmarking that compares you to other businesses in your industry. It'll really help you see how you're tracking and, and it'll help you to understand uh, how, uh, how other industries do, others in your industry are doing. Would you like that? Oh yes, please, that sounds great. Now it's gone to 947. It's a relatively small price jump. And so Scott, if you are watching, um, the reason why we keep the, the math behind the scenes simple for add-ons is because you don't want to overcomplicate them. If you, want to add, if you want to offer something more complex, like you've done bookkeeping, and you want to offer them payroll, well, payroll's not an upsell. It's a different service. Payroll is what I call a cross-sell. If someone buys bookkeeping, and then they might be interested in payroll, you want to have a different model in the software. Because payroll is complex. You've got a different set of scope questions. How many employees have you got? Are they paid weekly? Are they paid monthly? Would you like us to do the end year filings for you? If you're in the UK, do you have P11Ds, benefits in kind? There's a whole bunch of questions to help that are important for pricing payroll. So payroll would not be an appropriate upsell to say bookkeeping. It's a separate service. So Scott, they were great questions. Thank you for pre-submitting them. We have 16 minutes left. So next question I have is from uh, Ray. Um, by the way, I have, a, I have someone says hi again, Mark, in the Facebook group. Just so you know, I have no idea who you are. If you're in the Facebook group watching this, in the description above or somewhere is a link to click on for you to give permission for me to see who you are. So I don't know who you are, whoever said hi, but hi anyway. Ray says, first time here. So welcome, Ray. Um, 
What is the best way to come up with fixed price for bookkeeping? We don't have enough data to do regression analysis. Okay, we sort of, I think I answered that with the question from Scott. So if you don't have enough, uh, if you don't have enough data, then use the bookkeeping special model that has a formula already built in for you as a starting point. Okay, and by the way, um, that formula is built into a free app. So if you're not using the software yet, if you go to the website, uh, which I think is, uh, well, I know it is. Uh, if you want to find more about the software, go to effectivepricing.co.uk. I'll get my team to put the links in the various places. If you go to the website, where you'll find more about, more about the software, you do have the option to grab a free pricing app. Um, the free pricing app allows you to uh, put some numbers in for bookkeeping work and it'll show you the pr some prices based upon based upon that survey I mentioned okay so feel free to use that it's a, it'll be an interesting starting point Ray um, and then the second part of the question were, uh, the question was if I use one of the existing models how can I tailor the price to Australian markets great question Ray uh, and if you're in Australia congratulations for being uh, up at what I guess is about four or five in the morning right now um, okay, uh, so very simple. Let me just go into, let me just, let me go firstly, let me show you that. Now I'll go into the software. So if you're in Australia, a couple of things that you can do. If I go into settings, that's the cogwheel in the top left, top right. And if I go to theme and design, then the first thing you'll want to do, this is where you can upload your logo. Uh, it's where you can change all the colors to your branding and make it your software. It's also where you can change your currency. So I guess in Australia, you'll keep it as dollars rather than you wouldn't put AUS in front of it or something. But if you're in South Africa, you might change that to Rand or whatever. So you can change the currency that you display the price in. Uh, you can change the date format. If you're in Europe, for example, you'll have European date format. Uh, if you are in Europe as well, I know that Europeans uh, have the... The, the thousand separators and the decimal points the other way around. I find that very strange. I live in Portugal now and I still find it hard to get used to. So if you see a thousand euros, it's one dot zero 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 comma zero zero. It's, it's, it's odd, but then yeah, that's what the Europeans do. Uh, so you, that's the first change that you can do. Uh, if you then go into the models, so I'm going back to the cogwheel um, and that was theme and design. If I go to model management, then You'll know, I said earlier, Ray, that I've created a number of different models for you. Now, what I've done with those models is I've, uh, there's me, um, what I've done with those models for you is I've put in some suggested prices to get you started. Now, they're suggested prices based on my experience. I've been in the profession now since 1988, and it's based on my experience, just as a starting point you can very easily change the prices. And one of the things I recommend, and I have a video on this, is that when you test a model, what you want to do is get one or two of your existing clients, uh, and, and not in front of them, but just put their details into the, go, go through the process like I did with forecasting just now, answer the questions, see how the price comes up. If it's too high or too low, go and tweak the model. But here's the other thing that you can do. So you're in Australia, uh, and if you're in something like, like South Africa, this would be really important as well. The, que the prices that I've built in to get you started are prices that are um, based on US dollars. So let's say, for example, that you want to use this model for setting people up on a cloud accounting system. Let's say zero. So I'm going to hit use model. So I've written this for you already. I'm going to hit this. It's going to clone it. Um, now, I'm going to, let, let's imagine that you, you like zero. So you're in Australia and you want to have a, a zero setup model. We can change the name. You can add and allocate the one page templates that you've created here. And then we go into save and continue. And this is where you now set up the questions and so on. But rather than building it from scratch, you've got my existing, my suggested questions and suggested pricing. But because you're in Australia, the prices might come out to, let me think this one through, too low because Australia, uh, Australian dollars are, if I remember right, um, one uh, Australian dollars are, they're not the same as, I know what I mean. One, one US dollar is probably something like 1.3 Australian dollars, I'm guessing. And so there's, 
so what I would do, two options, two options. The th one option is you could go through and edit every single question. And in this particular case, it says, what do you want to move from? And I've got a drop down box. You ask the client, do you want to move to zero from QuickBooks Online? Uh, and if so, it's 500 as a starting point in the math. So if, it, if I was in Australia, I would modify this table. And if the exchange rate difference was one US dollar to 1.3 Australian dollars, I would multiply 500 by 1.3. Okay, now that's one way of doing it. And it would mean going through all of the questions and anywhere there's a, a number, a price, you would want to increase by effectively the exchange rate between US dollars and your currency. There's a shortcut. If you don't want to do that to start with, you just want to get up and running fast, then if you go to the next stage of the workflow of creating editing models, it's called expressing price. And when you go to expressing price, you have something called the global adjuster. Okay, and it's got one in there by default. And that's because the way the math works is the price is built up based on how the client asks the question. So the questions is the most important part of the software in terms of you putting the numbers in there. Once the software has calculated the price based on those scope questions and preference questions, once the price has been calculated, the next thing it does is it multiplies by the global adjuster, which by default is one, which means it does nothing. Okay, it doesn't change anything whatsoever. But the reason for it is, let's say, that you are in Australia, and it's currently right now, and I don't know by the way, but it's it's, it's 1, 1.3 Australian dollars to 1 US dollar. If you just put 1.3, what that will do is it will uplift all of the prices and multiply them by 1.3. So rather than going to every question and separately changing all the prices, you could make that one change and that will convert the prices from US dollars to Australian dollars. Now, the other reason for a global adjuster while I'm on this is it might be that you've been using the software for, for six, eight, nine months, getting great results, but you want to start increasing your prices. We have something called inflation. You want to put your price up by 10%. If you want to put your price up by 10%, then you've got two options. One, the more thorough option, go back to questions and go through all the questions and revisit your prices. If you want a really simple way, 1.1 will multiply the price by 1.1. Of course, if you're in the Australia and you had 1.3 in the first place, then you'd want to put that from 1.3 to 1.33, and that would be a 10. No, that wouldn't be right, would it? What's it? You know what I mean? It's one point. Uh, is it 1.43? Is 10 percent? I'm, I'm an accountant. You know what I mean? I think you do. I think I know what I mean. Right. Um, I think that answered that question, though that was a two-part question as well. We have seven minutes left, so let me uh, just hurry up a little bit because we've got, I, don't I won't necessarily get to everyone's questions, so I've got eight, I've got seven more questions. If you haven't asked your question yet, I may not get to it this week. We have another session next week, though. Sheila says, are all the checklists available for download on the website? If you mean the checklist, if you mean uh, what I shared with you earlier, these checklists, no, they're all they're a PDF document, and the links. Um, you're in Zoom right now. The links, the links in the Zoom chat. It's it's there. Uh, and what we'll probably do, uh, we think these checklists will really help you get up and running. Um, even if you've been using the software for a few months, they'll be a useful reminder. So our plan is we'll probably put the link to this checklist every week, just as a reminder. So uh, yeah, just find the link, grab it, stick it somewhere safe, Sheila. Uh, Nancy says, uh, this might just be, yes, as a CPA in the US, we need engagement letters and that sort of legal mumbo jumbo. Okay, thank you for confirming that. Um, uh, ah, and Nancy says, I have a potential $100,000 plus meeting today. Nancy, I wish you the best of success with that. I hope you're successful. And, uh, and please let me know how that goes. If it's, uh, I'd, love to, I'd love to hear, Nancy. Uh, Graham Costa says, ICAW still want legal wording. Yes. Um, um, I remember Graham, because obviously I'm guessing obviously you're a, an, an institute member. I remember that uh, the institute, when I was in, the pra in pr practice, had this kind of suggested wording for fees that said that uh, something like uh, our fees would be based upon the number of hours it takes and, uh, and the level of seniority. It was, it was that was it. And, and one of the things that I think when I was first teaching value pricing, a lot of accountants in the UK would say, Mark, you can't do that. You've got to charge based on the hour. And I was saying, why is that? 
And they were saying, well, that's what the ICAW put in their um, suggested template engagement letters. So uh, a friend of mine, Steve Pipe, who some of you, you, you have met, um, he checked that with the ICAW. He says, is that really right? And they said, no. They said, you can charge, uh, and this was, I think, the ess essence of the answer, you can charge your client in any way you want, including the phases of the moon, as long as it's agreed in writing and the client's happy with it. Okay, so you, you can price in any way that you want. I say that um, there are some restrictions in the US with... Uh, Treasury Circular 230, that you can't use certain thing, types of pricing for, for tax work, like percentage pricing, like contingent pricing. But generally speaking, uh, anyway, I'm going off tangent, aren't I? Uh, Mick says, Mick, can you add video to the proposal, like in practice ignition? Um, do you know, nobody's asked for that, so no is the answer. You can add images, you can't add a video. Um, I like that idea, I really do. Um, we are actually, and it might be too late, but we are just about to start the next sprint of the software with some enhancements to the proposal side of things. One of the things that, one of the things that uh, wasn't available before is we've asked the developers to make to, to allow you to turn certain text into clickable links, which means that you can have a link through to a video. Um, but you can't have the video embedded itself, but it's an interesting idea, Mick. We'll add it to our list of things to ask the developers. Okay, four minutes left. Mary says, do you ever value price based on annual revenue? I have tried this before, but not sure if that is built into the software. Uh, yes is the answer. Uh, so um, if you're pricing bookkeeping work, my personal view is that because bookkeeping from a, from a, a scope point of view is largely data entry, and therefore when you're pricing bookkeeping work, you probably want your price to be based on the num some form of number of transactions. And when I've, in that research study back in July 2019, that's how most bookkeepers around the world come up with their price. It's based on number of transactions. Interestingly, there are a few bookkeepers I've, I've, I've met and worked with who say that they just provide price based on annual revenue. And it works for them. Well, if it works for them, that's fine. But I noticed, Mary, you're a CPA. So when I was in practice, I started my accounting firm way back in 1996. I started off with time-based billing because I thought you had to do that. It wasn't until 1999 when I first came across Ron Baker and he taught me value pricing. And at the end of 1999, I wanted a, I wanted a pricing system to give clients and more important prospective clients a fixed price there and then for annual financial statements. In the UK, we just call it annual accounts. And so I was wrestling in 99 with how to do it. And when I came up with the answer, in November 99, I wrote the first person, the first version of my pricing software. So this software actually goes back to, uh, why have I got that screen? Um, this, version, this software actually goes back to 1999. The very first version was written in my, my, my accounting firm. And when I was battling with the idea of how do I come up with a fixed price for annual financial statements? And I did this regression analysis I mentioned earlier in my own practice. I did the regression analysis. And I realized from my experience that the, the single biggest thing the impact on the price I charge people for annual financial statements was the size of the business in terms of annual revenue. And so within the software, the very first question for annual financial statements, if you use that template, is what's your annual sales? What's your annual revenue? And that's the starting point of the calculations. So Mary, yes is the answer. And yes, you can do it in the software. I, I, I do think that for annual financial statements, that the Revenue is the most important, what I would call the primary scope factor. Um, it, so for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, one of the things I teach is that any service that we offer, we want to figure out what's the primary scope factor. What's the thing that has the biggest impact on the price? Bookkeeping, number of transactions. Payroll, number of employees, the number of payrolls we have to run. Annual financial statements, annual revenue. Tax returns, number of different sources of income. And I would always recommend in the software, that that primary scope question is the first question you ask, because that's the one that starts the ball rolling with how the price will calculate. Okay, Mary, that was a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, we have one minute left. Let me, and I have two questions. No, I, um, I think Graham's is a comment. Uh, so Graham Costa says they still have the hours per hour, the, 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 per hour and seniority in their template. It doesn't surprise me, Graham, that the Institute haven't changed at all since I was in practice in 2006. Okay, uh, so this is the last question. I know we've I know we've actually officially finished, but since it's Nina and she's a lovely person, 
Uh, and by the way, Nina, uh, you asked a question recently about how you all avoid overwhelm. I've got loads of thoughts for you. And uh, I was going to do a video for you, but I think what I might do is do a, a, tr a live training session, Nina, to answer that. Anyway, that's not your question here. Uh, Nina says, I price each service separately, uh, but when I have a client that is looking for multi-services, for example, bookkeeping, payroll, and taxes, uh, I bring it all together when they are looking for their overall monthly fee, or question mark. Uh, yes, that's a good question, Nina. So uh, I, I do recommend that all the the main different services, and so in this example, bookkeeping, payroll, taxes, you price them separately with separate models. And there's a number of reasons for that. One is the fact, one is they all have different scope factors. If you try, you can in the software, by the way, you can make a combined big model that can be used to give a single price for a service that includes bookkeeping, payroll, and taxes. You end up building quite a complicated model. And there's some reasons why I suggest you do it separately. But Nina's question is, I want to bring it all together um, when they're looking for the overall monthly fee. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we are working on, is a, and there's a great suggestion from, from David Colts again over in, uh, in, in Texas, in Houston, uh, which, we, which we, is on our development list, is a way, a way David's here. Hi there, David. It, I, we don't forget your, what, David comes up with wonderful suggestions. Unfortunately, so many, we can't do them all at the same at once, but they do get there eventually, David, like your custom keywords. So uh, I, do, I still want to do the, the, the suggestion whereby you can do those three prices and then in the software there's a functionality to bring them together and create one master proposal. So watch this space, Nina. It will happen because I think it's uh, something a lot of people will like. Um, but, I, but I would, for now, what I would recommend is you price them separately because they're different scope factors anyway. And I would do, personally, I would still do a separate fixed price agreement or proposal for each of them. I'd have a bookkeeping agreement, a payroll agreement, and a taxes agreement. And I'd have a separate payment plan for each. And the reason I suggest that is because this day and age, it's so easy to collect money every month. Go cardless in the UK, whatever it might well be that you use. It's so easy to collect money and do the bookkeeping that I would keep the different recurring payments separate. And the reason I suggest that is if they're paying you three amounts a month, one for bookkeeping, one for payroll, one for taxes, rather than one big monthly payment, it means that if the scope of work changes in one of those things, they take on extra employee, you only have to reprice the payroll bit of it. You can leave the bookkeeping and the, and the taxes. Uh, that's the way I would do it. I would, I would, I would keep the services separate. But... Uh, if you want to combine them, we will be bringing a feature at some point in the, the, the future. So thank you for that question, Nina. And, and I think we'll just, uh, and David's post in there basically has the same issue, which yes, I know David because you gave me the feedback and it's not been forgotten. Uh, okay, thank you for the great questions. Uh, that was awesome. We have run out of time, unfortunately, but uh, if you're in the Value Price Academy or the Bookkeeper's Price Academy, we're live next week with all the Academy sessions. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, if you're not, but you've enjoyed this session, uh, I'm live again, same time next Friday. I don't know what the theme of next week's session will be yet. Today was a beginner one. So next week, we'll probably dive into something in the software. If anyone's got any themes on something they'd like me to focus on, particularly within the software, last month we looked at menu pricing and I went through how to set that up. If anyone's got any requests for next Friday, let us know via the Facebook group. Uh, and I will spend the first 10, 15 minutes looking at a theme, and then we'll answer questions again. Okay, thank you so much. Have an awesome weekend, and I will see you, I will see you online very soon. Bye for now. Take care.